appreciate everybody that showed up this evening. I'd like to personally thank the owners of this fine establishment for inviting me here tonight. I want to talk to you about a few things that happened in my life. Just a few. Oh, I see there's a couple members of the press in the back. The press and I got very, very well acquainted. You see, I was bothering them every other day to post things for me. And we'll get into that in just a moment. But I have a special fondness for A.C. Pratt, who combined the Genoa Courier and the Genoa Record to become the Genoa Courier Record, which eventually became Minden's Record Courier. Another couple of people that I'd dearly love to thank were the Blakes and Mrs. Droust. Mrs. Droust, Doust, sorry. She and the Blakes were responsible for keeping the territorial enterprise alive long after Mark Twain was there. They were wonderful people as well. But, Doc, but A.C. Pratt, that man was a true journalist, an absolute hero in my book because he would post things no matter what his personal beliefs were. And he was a true believer in the free speech and the right to free speech. And I also see a couple of people out there that I know from the Carson Valley. Last time I saw some of you, right? It was the night your dad came knocking on my door to get me to come over to help deliver you. You've grown up. Crazy, I don't know how the time has flown so far. I think tonight I was asked here to mostly talk about my life in the temperance movement. I'm sorry to the proprietor of this fine establishment, but you and I will be talking later. <laughs> and I was also invited to talk about my life as a suffragist. <sighs> to begin, well, the temperance movement is easy, so let's talk about that first. It started when I was 14, and we had just moved to Sheridan, Nevada, where my Uncle John Gratis lived. Uncle John, you see, was an upstanding member of the Reformed Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Mormons. And because of such, he was very much into a alcohol-free home. I have lived in a dry home my entire life, so I knew no different. But I joined a little group called the Band of Hope. You see, the Band of Hope was began back in 1847, many years before I was even born. But it was established by Anne Marie Carlyle in the United Kingdom. And it was a place for children who, who were products of broken homes due to alcohol to come and to get relief from living off the streets because their parents had drunk their money away. So she started that, and the Band of Good Hope, when it came across the seas, it came with the Mormon community. And I joined at the age of 14. And after talking to my friends in the Band of Good Hope, and of course with my uncle and his peers about the sins and the wages of death with alcohol, I vowed right then at 14 years of age, I was going to protect my community from that horrible devil's drink. It was my civic duty to protect them. I kept up with the band of hope until I was a little bit older, and then I joined the Women's Christian Temperance Movement. We protested and marched and marched and protested up and down the entire northern part of Nevada. I got to be such a pest that some of the thirst fathers downstairs. <laughs> and I was actually met at several, several establishments with a bucket of muddy water from being mop water. It's amazing how they timed it when I walked up to the steps of the establishment and then had to sidestep quickly to miss as they slopped the bucket out the door. Amazing, amazing timing. And I would stand there quietly and I'd pass out my pamphlets to talk gently to people about 
what they were doing to themselves and their families by entering this vile establishment. Some of those places even went far enough to have some little boys that they probably hired for some sweet candy or a penny to lead my horse away with my buggy. I had no idea, and they'd be on the opposite side of the horse, so I couldn't tell they were there. And I had no idea if they were trying to scare me and to think that my horse had run off. Didn't work. My horse was a good horse, and she knew who the boss was, I think. Did not work. <laughs> I have been spit upon. I have been shoved. I've been pushed to the ground. I have been manhandled and abruptly moved from areas while I was trying to help people and teach them about the wages of sin and alcohol. It was a rough, rough time. In 1892, I went to my first large meeting of the Temperance Union. Boy, that was an eye-opener. There were a lot of people there that were very much in favor of what I was doing. And it was a, it was a refreshing, a refreshing thing. I found out that because by that time I was already a doctor here in Nevada, and as I talked to the people and the uh, participants at this conference, they liked what I had to say, and they respected me, and they totally understood where I was coming from in my heart. They understood, and they elected me vice president of the women's temperance, Christian women's temperance movement in Carson City. And I served in that capacity till 1896, where I finally elected me president. It was such an honor to be able to serve in that capacity in my community and throughout Northern Nevada. I remained the president of that group until 1901. It was such an honor and a privilege for me, it really was. Temperance went a long ways, and it did a lot of good. I feel, some may not feel that way. <laughs> I've ended up hearing a lot of nice stuff and interesting facts about another movement that was sweeping the nation, the women's suffrage movement. Now for those of you that don't know what that was, it's women picketing and protesting and trying to persuade the male of persuasion to vote for the women's right to vote referendum. We diligently worked on that and again I was kicked, I was shoved, my papers were slapped out of my hand, I was jostled and moved and physically moved, spat upon, cursed at. I just didn't understand. All we wanted was equal rights with men. But I guess in 1892 that was totally unheard of. So we weren't able to really push that referendum forward. We kept trying and we kept trying. See, I didn't have a spouse. And there's kind of a reason behind that. When I was 11, I read a passage from the Bible. And it said, from Genesis chapter 3, Thy will shall be thy husband's, and he shall rule over thee. <laughs> Even at 11, that rankled me. That really rankled me. I didn't quite understand the passage at the time. I was 11, so I asked my mother, Mother, what does this mean? And she says, well, she says, Eliza, what that means is when a woman gets married, her husband will rule over her. That was enough to quiet my 11-year-old tongue, but not my mind. You see, my mother and father were born in the United Kingdom. 
They came across the Atlantic Ocean and landed on the eastern seaboard. Seaboard, excuse me. And they came across the United States in a wagon train destined for Salt Lake City to join the Mormons. It was a beautiful place in Salt Lake City from what I remember. But you see, my mother and father were born in January of 1856. My sister Rebecca, my older sister, she was born in February of 1856. <laughs> Apparently, according to church rules, so long as my parents' marriage was on the records with the church, it didn't matter when the children came along. So, that was one telltale sign. <laughs> the next one was I was born in 1858, and then my little brother Samuel came along in 1859. I remember Samuel's birth like it was yesterday. My poor dear mother was screaming and crying, and at three, all I wanted was to be next to her. I wanted to hold her hand, I wanted to make her feel better, but the mean ladies that lived in our house with us, they grabbed me and physically dragged me from the room. Over and over again, my poor mother screamed and, and cried out in pain, and I heard words bandied around like, not going to make it, breach, get this tool, get that tool, which I didn't know, I was so young. But finally Samuel came into the world, but he was a frail child, and the rigors of his birth had taken a very hard toll on him. Very hard toll. He passed away at three months. And I remember my mother, she was devastated. Father didn't seem to be so upset. Neither did the other women that lived in our house. But mother had had enough. She gathered up Rebecca and I, and she moved us to Crystal Springs, Idaho, in the Oregon Territory. She worked hard, we rented a single room at a boarding house, and she worked hard taking in laundry and doing what she could do to support us. She worked herself to the bone, basically. Rebecca and I tried to help her, but we were so, so little at the time. But she saved enough money and eventually she moved us down to White Pine County where she was able to get a, a job as a manager of a boarding house. And after a while, the gentleman that had the boarding house sold it to my mother. And my mother was now a proprietor of a boarding house. Rebecca and I did what we could for chores. We gathered eggs, did what we could to help her along. But in the evening, she always had time for us, always. She'd help us learn to read and learn to write and to do sums, it was unheard of for young women to know that. It was unheard of. Mother worked hard and eventually she sold the boarding house and we moved west again. We moved to Sheridan, Nevada in Carson Valley. Carson Valley is a beautiful place, absolutely gorgeous. We moved up with my Uncle John Rabbits and mother again started taking in laundry, and Rebecca and I did chores for the neighbors, but we both had a passion for reading. And because we read all three of the books that we had in our possession, and several of Uncle John's that were fit for our feminine selves, <laughs> we borrowed books from the neighbors. Rebecca loved the romances and the the family ones and all of the tales about marriage and raising a family and all that. I liked science. I loved adventure. Jules Verne was my absolute favorite author. I would immerse myself in his adventures and off I would go around the world in 80 days under the oceans. I was 
his biggest fan, if there was such a thing back then. I really enjoyed a lot of books, but one book that really touched me when I was young, it was called The Botanical Physician's Book. The Botanical Physician's Book, and it was written by Mr. Thompson. I do believe he might have been a doctor as well. But when I read the book, could you believe it? Plants, ordinary plants that were outside, could be made into medicine. That fascinated me. So I proceeded to start gathering plants and hanging them in the house. Surprised my mother didn't have a fit. But she says, you know, all of these plants in here remind me of a meadow, so it's okay. And I tried to bring you up stuff with a rock and, you know, still wasn't quite sure what I was doing and I surely didn't give it to anybody because, you know, I didn't know exactly what I was doing. But that book changed my life. I went on to do a lot more with my medicine and that's a story for a few minutes from now. As I was part of the Women's Suffrage League, I attended a conference in Reno, Nevada. There with me were my two friends from Carson City, Hannah Clapp and Eliza Babcock. Now some of you may remember Hannah Clapp. She was responsible for the fence, that beautiful wrought iron fence that around the Capitol that still stands today. No, not as the rumors say, she and Hannah didn't physically go out there and build that fence night. No. She and Hannah were responsible for getting the bid, for the materials and the labor, and they came in the cheapest. So the committee that was tasked with building a fence gave the bid to them. It was funny. I asked Hannah, I said, why were you so adamant about building that fence? She says, well, as you well know, Eliza, I hate having to roll my skirts up and show my bloomers to walk to the Capitol because of all the cow muck. <laughs> Carson City just lets those herds of cows wander anywhere. And as you know, it gets on our skirts and then it's drug into the Capitol. And the whole Capitol smells like a stable. We need to do something, and Eliza and I came up with that. We put in a bid, and we won. Eliza and Hannah were dear, dear friends of mine. You know that they put in the first, or established the first kindergarten in Nevada? They were both teachers, and they visited in, around the world. They traveled a lot, and they visited Germany. <laughs> Apparently, while they were there, they visited the school, the teachers, and they saw the advantages of early childhood education on the students in Germany. So they said, we need that for our students in Nevada. And they established the first kindergarten in Carson City, Nevada. Excellent women. I was so proud to know them. So proud. But at this conference that we attended at the McKissick Opera House in Reno, I was voted vice president of the Women's Suffrage League. It was such an honor. It really was. And the fact that I was able now to also serve my community in twofold, not only with the right to vote for women, but with the temperance movement. It was a win-win for me. I was able to do what I loved doing in an official capacity. So we continued to struggle on for the women's vote. It was a challenge. Tenable spouse with which to do pillow talk, to encourage him to vote our way about the referendum, or to have him encourage his friends about the referendum, and how they should vote as well. So I had to do the old-fashioned bandwagon, stumping and bandwagon, protests, marches, 
lectures. I would go anywhere and everywhere if somebody would actually have me come and talk about the women's right to vote. And I always throw in a few temperance facts just for fun. <laughs> always had to get that word in there. We had a lot of women behind the scenes, pillow talking to their husbands, talking to their brothers and their uncles and their fathers and their grandfathers because we were on a mission. We were out to get a vote and a signature on a petition from every household in Nevada. That petition is what convinced the Nevada legislature, both houses, to vote finally in February of 1914 to pass the vote, women's vote referendum. Now see, the referendum was originally brought to light in, in Washington, D.C. by a senator from Kansas by the name of Sam Wood. And every year, Sam was there pushing that vote and pushing that vote. And fortunately, by that time, Nevada had finally brought itself into the 20th century. You see, Nevada and Montana had been the two black spots on the women's right to vote map in the West. To me, that was embarrassing. So we finally got the referendum passed. <laughs> and in February the 6th, 1920, the 19th Amendment was finally passed both houses of Congress. I was ecstatic. I was so proud and so enamored of the work that myself and my friends and my colleagues have done. We had the right to vote. We had a say in our government. We had a say on how life would be for us. It was a glorious day. And on November 7th, 1920, I voted in my first presidential election. I, Eliza Cook, got to go behind the curtain and cast my vote for who I thought should be president. That year, it was Cox and, get this right, <laughs> Cox and Calvin Coolidge that won that year, and it was, I'm sorry, I had that backwards. <laughs> I'll come back to them. It was Cox and Franklin Delano Roosevelt who were the party for the Democrats, and Eugene B. Debs and Seymour Stedman that were the Socialist Party. And it was James Harding and Calvin Coolidge that won the presidential election that year. Although that wasn't my preferred party, just the fact that I got to go behind that curtain, that me, a woman from Nevada, could go and make my voice heard. It was a very proud day indeed. It really was. And I mind you, the whole time out of this temperance and women's voting referendum business was going on. I was also a full-time doctor in Carson Valley. To say my schedule was full is an understatement. I finally, after reading Dr. Thompson's book about the medicinal herbs, I finally got to lay my hands on actually practicing medicine to a degree. I was hired on by H. W. Smith, doctor, in Genoa. And Dr. Smith took me on as his assistant. I could add another seven titles behind that word to make up for what I actually did because I cleaned the floors, I mopped the floors, I cleaned the shelves, I sterilized the shelves, I sterilized the exam room. I 
took care of his medicinal garden. I took, um, you know, his his record books and helped him with his records because I had been taught well in numbers. I helped him with his appointments. I stayed at the practice when he had to go out on a call. I was a very busy young lady at 20. But Dr. Cook had faith in me. I'm sorry, Dr. Smith had faith in Dr. Cook. And he had me take care of his wife. You see, they just had their first son. And she contracted what's called puerperal fever. Puerperal fever killed women after childhood. We don't have actual records of how many, but that's usually what killed women after childbirth. You see what happens is a tiny bit of the placenta does not release from the uterus, and that little piece starts to fester, and it causes the woman to have severe cramping, severe bleeding, and fever. And back in the day when they didn't know what it was, it would kill them. But I nursed Mrs. Smith, I nursed her, I made her bra, I made her eat, I wiped her brow when she was fevered, I administered what Dr. Smith gave me to give to her, I helped her and I held the baby for her so that she could, she could feed him because she was too weak to feed him. But I helped her and when she got well, Dr. Smith was ecstatic that she came around and he told me right then and there, he says, Eliza, you need to be a doctor. You need to be a doctor. I just laughed and said, no, I don't have the schooling, I don't have the education. I don't have the book learning. So for the next year or so, Dr. Smith brought out every medical book that he could find. He had some shipped in from San Francisco, and he coached me. As we worked alongside, he even let me sit in on a couple of surgeries to test my sturdiness against the side of blood. Apparently I passed, because when I was 22 years old, he encouraged me to apply to Cooper College in San Francisco. Such a long ways from home. But Dr. Smith had every confidence in me. And I did apply, and he helped me write my admissions letters. And I was accepted. I and four other female students were going to go through the doctor's program at Cooper College. You see, Cooper College went on to become a little known place of Stanford Medical College. Leland Stanford, railroad tycoon at the time and governor of California, set aside a tract of land so that this college could be built because he had lost his son to typhoid two years before because there weren't enough doctors to see everybody that got sick during that pandemic and his very own beloved son died. And right then and there, Governor Stanford decided, I'm going to open up a medical school and train as many doctors that I can for the wilds of the West so that nobody has to die. I went to school, and this was another spot that I met a lot of resistance. You see, women weren't supposed to be doctors. It was against the sacred sacrament, sacrament given only to men to become physicians. So myself and my four female uh, campus mates, again, we were spit upon, pushed, shoved, papers dropped out of our hands. The same kind of things that would happen to me as a temperance leader and as a suffrage leader. They even went so far as to destroy our, our laboratory work. They would steal our papers off of the professor's desks so that we would get a zero in those particular tests or whatever papers we had to turn in. 
They even went so far as to hide the library books that we needed to study. Well, the female librarian caught on to that real quick. And she took to hiding the books for us on the side so that we weren't without the study materials that we needed. I don't think if it wasn't for her, I would be a doctor today. She was just a very astute woman and saw the need for female doctors. While I was at school in March, let's see, it was uh, 1892, I believe, friends and family that lived in Genoa awoke to a thunderous roar of an avalanche barreling down the mountainside toward their little community. It was very early in the morning and it caught a lot of people unawares. The avalanche did go through the community of Genoa and many people were killed and many weren't. One lady rode her bed all the way across the snow and out into a field <laughs> from her home after it was destroyed. The avalanche also split as it was coming down Genoa Canyon and it took out the mortuary and it split around the day house and it traveled across the road and out into a long house that was occupied by a Washam Paiute family. Seven members of that family were killed. It was a tragic day in Genoa. It was tragic for me because I was so far from home and I couldn't help my community as I wanted to. I would get letters from friends and family and read the horror stories that they were telling me and see the newspaper articles from back home. In fact, it made the newspapers in San Francisco. That's how dramatic it really was. But again, I wasn't able to help. Well, I went on to graduate from Cooper College with honors, despite my male colleagues, and I became a doctor. I hung my shingle out at my sister Rebecca and her husband Hugh Park's home in Sheridan. Hugh and Rebecca were so sweet to me, they got me a beautiful gentle mare and a very lovely black single horse carriage. Imagine the sight that I brought about, I brought about coming across that valley with my black horse. Black buggy and my black clothes. I took to making cookies and bringing them with me if I had small patience because I was a very frightening countenance. I did well for my community. I set bones. I cured cured elements. I delivered babies, and I'd even go back to the moms and the families to make sure that those babies were thriving and that the mother didn't have a girl fever. I'd always try to take some dinner with me if I could or at the very least some fresh bread and applesauce just so I had something with me for the family because I knew the mothers were in no shape to try to cook. It was a wonderful time being a physician and I loved it so, but I, I kept on thinking that maybe there was more for me. Maybe there was more. Well, there wasn't a whole lot more for me, but it was very exciting doing what I did. And in 1890, 1898, my dear mother, Margaret Braddock's cook, passed away. Mother and I and Rebecca were very close, so this was a very hard thing for me to deal with. We laid her to rest in the Mottsville Cemetery, overlooking the valley. And I knew right then and there, that's where I wanted to spend my eternal sleep. She was right next to the Park family's plot, so I knew she'd be well taken care of as we married into the family. After Mother passed, I went back east again, this time to uh, study. I studied in Philadelphia and the New York Women Colleges for Medicine. 
I furthered my education. I upped my degree in other areas that I had not been able to study in Cooper College. And while I was on the East Coast, I had I was afforded the opportunity to travel. So I went to the United Kingdom and visited England and Scotland and Ireland. And I went across to Europe and visited several countries there and on to, to Egypt and I saw the Great Pyramids. And I went on to Constantinople and Greece. I saw the cradle of democracy in Greece. I saw the cradle of civilization in what was then known as Persia. What an adventure. When I got home, everybody wanted me to come to their dinner parties and their teas to talk about my travel. They go, oh, we want to hear so much about these lovely, beautiful, fabulous, exotic places. And I thought about the back streets of Constantinople and the hovels in Egypt. And to me, they weren't really that exotic, but I guess for Carson Valley, they pretty much were. So I would have regale all my friends with the tales of my adventures. It was quite a time. And as I said, I continued on with my uh, presidency with the Temperance Union until 1901. Well, after I got back with these new degrees, I decided I was going to have my shingle in Nevada. I was going to open my surgery in Reno. That lasted about two months. And I scurried back home because I have never found a place that suited me better than the Carson Valley. The things were getting a little tight at Rebecca and Hugh's home because they were having children. So I built myself my own little home in 1911. I had a big kitchen built so that I could have all of my apothecary, I could have all of my herbs hanging, I had a little tiny three-foot stove, not much bigger than this table, that I would cook my food on, that I always had a kettle boiling, and I had a oven that had doors on both sides for baking. So no matter what, I could have a chicken in one side and a loaf of bread in the other. It was wonderful. My little home was my, my pride and joy. I had a small surgery. It had my bedroom and then my large kitchen. I always entertained everybody in the kitchen anyway. Who doesn't, right? So we went ahead and um, had myself and another friend help me plant trees. So not only did I have a medicinal garden, a flower garden, a vegetable garden, I now had an orchard. And I was so determined that I took care of that orchard myself. I pruned it myself, I irrigated it myself. It was my orchard. It was a fantastic time in my life. Um, I think it was December uh, in 1921, I delivered my great-great-niece, Luella Dressler Canaris. She was the last baby that I gave birth, or helped birth, I think it I helped birth. Shortly after that, I decided, Eliza, it's time to retire. You have a garden, you have your beautiful orchard that's now producing fruit. Life's too short. You've given your give for your community. It's your turn. So I took down my shingle, donned my gardening hat, and I got busy in my gardens. I had vegetables, I had fruit from my trees, I pickled, I canned, I made applesauce. I was touted as the best applesauce in Barcelona Valley. I don't know about the best, but it was pretty darn good. You know what the secret is? A pinch of cinnamon in every jar makes you taste like you're eating fresh apple pie. It's a great thing. I did have good applesauce though. <laughs> Once I retired, I did have a chance to work with the youth in our community. No, not about temperance. 
but more about determining and reaching their goals. I wanted them to do well for themselves. I wanted them to pursue higher education if they were so inclined. I particularly loved working with the young ladies that were interested in medicine. That, that did me good, you know, to hear that we want to be a doctor just like you, Dr. Cook. Okay, well, let's see where we got to start and what you have to study. I would write their letters of admission, I would send them letters of recommendation, and a lot of our young people from the Valley did go on to higher education. But the big wars came, and my heart was broken. I was heartsick at the loss of our young people, our young men and young women too, that we were losing to such a nonsensical thing. It hurt me deeply to know that I was no longer young enough to stand my stand and use my voice in protest. But that didn't harden my heart, but it did harden my mind, and it crystallized my resolve to talk against what I felt were social injustices, and my opinion that our socioeconomic, should, our socioeconomic system should become a commonwealth, and it should become a commonwealth soon. I've been on my soapbox again, here I am. You know, I think it's time for me to find my, my little nephew in the back and have him take me home. You know that. For some reason, at 91, they insisted that I ride up here with my nephew in his fancy automobile instead of hitching up my little wagon, my little buggy, and coming by myself. You know, at 91, maybe it was a good idea, but I do miss those beautiful rides across the valley in my single horse buggy to help my patients. I think I'll have him take me home so I can fix a cup of tea and write in my journal my life outline. Thank you. You have been a most gracious audience. Thank you so much for coming.